I thought before we get started, I would very briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, here on my left, we have Jerry Fallhaber, who, um, like me, uh, is on the faculty uh, at the uh, Wharton School in the Business, Economics, and Public Policy Department. He also happens to be a former chief economist at the FCC, so I am following in his footsteps. Uh, to the left, we have Shane Greenstein, who is uh, currently professor of business administration at the Harvard Business School, and uh, they are also co-chairs the HBS Digital In Initiative. Uh, John Mayo is a uh, professor of economics uh, here at the Georgetown Business School and the executive uh, chief um, of the Center for Business and Public Policy. And then last but not least, over there, Dan Rubenfeld uh, is professor of law at NYU and professor emeritus of law and economics at Berkeley. Um, as the goal of the panel here today is to tease out policy recommendations for the incoming administration, potentially FCC or any other body in the um, uh, digital infrastructure area. What I thought I would start with is just ask our panelists, given their background uh, in the area for three policy recommendations for the incoming administration, and then we'll open it for questions uh, from the floor afterwards. Um, I thought, Dan, maybe we'll start with you over there. Is that okay? or? Uh, sure, whatever, whatever you have in mind. Uh, uh, I thought actually everyone, I would have uh, already heard everything from my other three panelists. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the areas that I've gotten very interested in has been the growth of big data. And I have an, uh, an article coming out with my co-author, Michal Gal. <coughs> and in thinking about big data, uh, a really undefined topic, a lot of qu questions have arisen that, uh, that would affect digital infrastructure. So uh, we, we sometimes think of big data as focusing on search because there's been a lot of questions about Google's dominance in search, but actually applies much more broadly. Uh, and as we're moving more and more to a world of streaming, uh, streaming movies and, and video and so on, big data really has a much broader context. So the <coughs> Excuse me. The, the key question in my mind is whether the presence of big data creates bottlenecks to either to demand side network effects or on the supply side to scale economies or certain uh, limitations due to patents and other form of IP. And then if there are such bottlenecks, uh, we may need to ask the question whether they're wireless, whether they're related to the internet or whatever, or whether perhaps they're tied to the set-top boxes. In, in every case, we have to ask ourselves, are these bottlenecks that uh, can be reasonably remedied by the participants in the industry? Uh, because participants do have an incentive uh, to uh, make sure that the, anything that is a bottleneck will be functioning well for their own customers. <clears throat> uh, and they may well institute pricing mechanisms to try to, in, try to make that occur. And we are likely in an oligopolistic world, as Howard was talking about. So we're going to be talking about two, three, four firms doing so. Um, and uh, we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, will that internal mechanism of working with the economy be, in, be enough to manage bottleneck problems, or do we need some regulatory overlay? We probably do, but exactly what form that will take, I think, is going to be, is going to be very important. <clears throat> One of the things that specifically worries me about, uh, as, it does, as it does Howard, is the incentives that are created for building the right infrastructure. So for example, we were just talking about 5G. <clears throat> I have a concern that, uh, left to its own, the market may not create sufficient incentives to get in the internet back when we need to make 5G functional. Broadly, and, all, uh, and by broadly, I mean giving us access to everyone, including the folks we care about with respect to universal service. So uh, there, that's a quick description of an extremely broad set of questions that, that I've been thinking about. <clears throat> uh, second point is uh, something in passing that probably barely fits in this area, but is important to me. I, I just finished a couple of years of serving on a, a National Academy of Sciences panel on digital preservation. And we are concerned mainly about, about thinking about getting a historical record uh, that will allow for future analysis of what's happening in the digital world. <clears throat> and uh, this is particularly important to me, given th this, the move we see to streaming 
uh, video, movies, and so on. It would be really nice to find uh, some agency or combination of agencies who would actually keep track uh, of the history of, of where we are and where we're going uh, so that we can do better economic analysis and, and really have a, a pretty good story of where the innovation is occurring. To my knowledge, uh, no one has a pure uh, uh, private incentive to, to make that investment. I definitely know that the movie industry doesn't even though they would like to see it happen, and I can say the same thing about other industries. So I would like to see either Congress or uh, the executive branch or some combination uh, find a way to, to create uh, financial support for digital preservation. <clears throat> it's a very difficult problem with technology changing because, as you all know, <clears throat> anything we keep in a digital record actually depreciates at a pretty rapid rate both because the bits and bytes disappear, but also because the technology to read the material disappears. <clears throat> so that's a second area that I wouldn't normally think would fit here, but is very important to me. And third, there's kind of a, uh, there's kind of a management problem that I see as important. Uh, bottleneck issues are a good example. Uh, the, <clears throat> the Department of Justice, where I worked for many years, uh, worries about bottlenecks all the time. Uh, but the DOJ or the FTC are only concerned about bottlenecks either created through mergers or otherwise that, that uh, violate the statutes that are in their coverage. <clears throat> but bottleneck problems can go broader than that, which is not surprisingly why the FCC and other agencies worry about it as well. I don't think we've done a good job yet of figuring out how to balance the efforts <clears throat> of the various agencies that deal with bottlenecks. <clears throat> They're so complicated and so important as we move into the digital world that we really need some, some desirable allocation of functions. Uh, and so, for example, the thought that the DOJ or the FTC would take the lead on bottleneck problems created by mergers and with the FCC perhaps uh, playing a more diminished role uh, makes some sense to me. Uh, but on the other hand, there are bottleneck problems that and DOJ and the FTC really can't handle formally under their authority that either the FCC or some other agencies really need to worry about. <clears throat> so we have kind of a political economy issue, which is how to manage uh, digital uh, infrastructure in the future, and we need, uh, we need some thoughtful people to think about it. So I'll stop there. John? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, even if I was the one that invited myself, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> so thanks for uh, hosting. You asked for three policy priorities. Of course, the FCC can't do everything. So let me just mention three. Uh, one we'll call an oldie but goodie, and then the other two are a little less orthodox, but I think also quite important. The oldie, and good, oldie but goodie is universal service. Uh, of course, universal service as a goal has been around for 100 years to with the idea of enhancing deployment to and adoption by uh, households to improve the connectivity of the American people, to improve the connectivity of the American people. And the way that has been manifest in public policy terms has been, largely speaking, historically, to subsidize eligible households on the, on the adoption side anyway, to subsidize eligible households with a discount wired service to their home, to their house, to their infrastructure. Today, uh, we all know that there's been a revolution of how people communicate. We now use our cell phones to do it. Uh, and that means that the notion of universal service to being defined by connectivity to a house is really, I think, an irrelevant and antiquated notion. I think we can now begin to think of connectivity uh, at a personal level uh, based on where people are and the devices they use. So uh, a, some colleagues of mine, Jeff Macker at Georgetown, Olga Kaneva, also at Georgetown, and uh, Glenn Warwick at uh, UC Berkeley, and I have developed a paper uh, that looks at, uh, at an individual level, uh, what devices people subscribe to, wireless or wireline, and their mobility over the course of the day to construct a connectivity index to say, how connected are the American people at any point in time over the course of the day, given their mobility patterns and given the technology they use? And what we find is that over the last 15 years, there's been a massive growth in that connectivity, uh, to the point that at uh, any point in time over the, over the course of the day, on average, 
of the American people are connected to the communications grid, on average, 92 percent. I suspect in this room it's 100 percent because every single person in here has a cell phone, I think. So that's a massive change, and I think it allows us to begin to, and I think the next administration might take this on, to really reorient the notion of universal service away from infrastructure and wires to one of more personal connectivity. So that's number one. Uh, and that's the oldie but goodie. The, two, the next one, uh, which is uh, not an oldie but goodie, is in the area of competition. Uh, and I'd really like to see more uh, emphasis on the notion of competition. Of course, the FCC uh, thinks about competition, renders judgments every, every year on a, both an ad hoc basis and on a systematic basis on competition. On an ad hoc basis, competition concerns drove the uh, open internet order. Competition concerns drove uh, a move away from an unfettered auction and incentive auctions. On a systematic basis, competition uh, assessments have to occur by statute in local telephony, in wireless telephony, and in uh, cable telephony, or the MVPD, multi-channel video programming distribution market, on an annual basis. It happens routinely, and yet, if you really sort of open up the tent a bit on this, the a dispassionate assessment would say either the FCC isn't, the, there, it's not entirely opaque, let me, or let me say it is entirely opaque, <laughs> what the FCC means by the term competition. It's a, it's a mantra, competition, 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 but, but to an economist you have to say, well, what do, you have to ask the more primitive question, what do we mean by competition? Uh, just to pick an example, uh, in the cable television area, effective competition has alternatively over the last 15 years been defined to be uh, three providers or alternatively six or alternatively two and alternatively defined either with or without a market share criteria attached to it where the market share criteria could be either measured by purchases or capacity and it could be market share of the smallest provider the largest provider so it for an external audience, I think, is a bit of a head-scratcher. I think this notion of not just sort of stepping up to the plate and taking on um, the notion of competition and tethering it a bit, tethering it more to the economics community, which has a rich tradition of assessing this, both at places like DOJ and within the industrial organization community more generally, I think would be a really good thing. Final thing I think uh, w uh, which would be a pro policy priority for me anyway for the next administration, and let me state it in the, uh, in the abstract first and then I'll try and drill down. At the abstract level, I'd say that we need to reorient the objective function of the FCC. That's, that's maybe too broad. Jerry's going to say, yes, that's, that's, that's a great idea. But, but let me be quite specific about that. Um, uh, in terms of the long history, the long history of the FCC, it was adopted uh, developed as a regulatory oversight body over what was considered to be a natural monopolistically uh, natural monopolistic industry and in that world investment really wasn't a big priority it wasn't a big priority because firms who were guaranteed a rate of return on prudently incurred investments uh, uh, were essentially guaranteed those returns so you knew you didn't have to worry that investment was going to happen and at least when I was young investment itself was mainly in the form of copper redeployment of older copper. Uh, today, with the explosion of demand for uh, wireless technologies and the explosion of demand for broadband, which collectively means that there's been a massive consumer demand increase in, for voice, data, and video, uh, the investment demands are immense relative to what they were before. Uh, and if you look at the sort of uh, challenge for companies, I think it, uh, you look at uh, Mike Mandel's here, uh, the PPI who uh, does an investment heroes report every year, studies the, the largest investors in this country. Turns out for the last several years, the largest investors in the entire economy have been AT&T and Verizon, year after year after year, $47 billion in the last, last year collectively. That's a lot of money. Investment's a big, big deal. And to maintain our leadership in this space, which Howard spoke about, 
we're going to have to keep doing more of that, and it's going to happen through the private sector, not the public sector. So, so how do we get that done, and how do we use policy to help enable that? Well, over in the Telecommunications Act of 1996, Section 706 explicitly authorizes the FCC to use, quote, regulatory methods to accelerate the deployment of advanced technologies. So we have a regulatory authorization, and we have what I'll say is assert is an economic imperative to more uh, uh, to improve our focus and to sharpen our focus on let's call it uh, investment enabling policies. Mm -hmm. So those would be my three. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I, I, I'm I'm a crazy note taker. I always have, you know. I have to have notes, so uh, I, I, you might as well see my notes too. So I put them on slides. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Anyway, um, you know, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Uh, and it's you know, I, I live outside the Washington bubble. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm just gonna say today I'm gonna play the role of outsider, and uh, my mission uh, today is to raise three uh, topics, and I'm gonna have some fun uh, while doing it. So. Okay, so the first thing is I'm an economist, and when you start as an economist, you look at prices. So I'm just going to tell you a fact about prices. Price, uh, this is the, you can look at the Consumer Price Index for uh, Internet access in the United States over uh, the last nine years, um, and it is effectively a broadband price index today. Uh, it, it has been since the latter part of the previous decade, and uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's flat. I mean, if anything, it's risen 5% over the last nine years. You may say, so what? We've lived with this. Let me just give you a point of comparison. Point of comparison, same period. PCs have declined 58%. Telephone equipment, 42%. Wireless telephone services, 15%. Okay, so you might start with that and just say, hmm, that, 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 should, that should raise a concern. So now, as an economist, your first reaction is, well, perhaps we have the wrong quality adjustment. Uh, so let's, we're not measuring prices correctly. Let's... let's uh, adjust for speed, uh, and I, I, I'm just going to guarantee you if you do that exercise, the adjustment will be modest. I've been suckered into doing this exercise twice now, and, uh, and, and I even did it on the dial-up uh, broadband upgrade where I was really sure it was going to be big. And it's modest, and it's modest for a very simple mathematical reason. The numerator is small and the denominator is large, okay? It's just, it's just algebra. You, it, it turns out you have a small number of adopters at any point in time of whatever's new, and we have a big country. And so consequently, no matter what you do, even if you've got a great big improvement in broadband, a few people use it, and so the price index, even if you do a quality adjustment, just doesn't uh, adjust very much. It, you get a modest improvement. So that's just number one. Number two about that is, well, maybe we're actually barking up the wrong tree. Uh, and not thinking about uh, prices correctly. And, and I actually think there's, uh, those of you who know me know, I, I have a, one of my hobby horses is digital dark matter. That is to say, things we all know is there, we just don't measure it. Um, and, and I actually think that's a big issue here. Uh, we have a lot of goods in the digital economy that are priced at zero. And uh, federal government, by its own rules, doesn't measure them because they're zero. Because uh, by the rules of GDP measurement, that means no transaction has taken place. I'm just telling you the rules, okay? Uh, uh, that's a problem, by the way, because the only thing that does get measured are the ad dollars. So if you think about it just for a moment, what does Google do? What does YouTube do? What does Facebook do? The only part of their activity that shows up in GDP accounting are the ad dollars. I'm just, just stating a fact. So the benefit you're getting from search, the benefit you're getting from connecting with friends, the benefit from watching a lot of cat videos, um, that doesn't, so none of that matters, okay? It's actually not part of the price index. So I'm actually giving you the other side of this. This is, uh, you know, maybe prices, maybe quality is not being properly measured. Uh, okay, I'll even go even further. Why don't we do it? Well, basically because it's too hard to do. <laughs> it's, it's hard to compute. Uh, when we can do it, actually the government does do it, but think about this because the question is actually hard. What is the price equivalent decline in access prices for the entry of Facebook and YouTube? Remember, in the period I'm just looking at here, YouTube is completely new and develops over this time period, and it plays no role in price indices. 
Is it equivalent to a 50% decline in price? <clears throat> Got to tell you, by the way, if you look at the data, 75% uh, of what people spend their time online doing today is stuff nobody was doing a decade and a half ago. So it, it actually is possibly a very large, unmeasured, qualitative gain. And it's not in our price deflators. I'm just going to talk like an economist. Okay? So, uh, and that means economic growth is potentially massively undercounted. <laughs> okay, just say, this is an issue. It's actually potentially going to be with us for a while. And uh, I think that's worthy of study. So let's go there. All right, so that's my first one. Let's go to number two. Oh, slides are still working good. Uh, someone's got to raise this one, so I'm just going to raise it. Uh, zero rating. Oh, God. This is going to be a headache. Uh, and it's going, to be, it's going to be with us for a while. Uh, okay, so first of all, let me just say, what do I mean by zero rating? This is the, the practice of uh, not counting data from an ISP source against the data count, however you might do it, whether it's a tiered or a data cap, that's, that's the practice. There is a big online debate about this. <laughs> uh, you know, I read the online world, and uh, uh, I'm going to caricature it a little bit, so I, I apologize to those of you who have taken part in it. Um, uh, but look, so on the one side, there's a, a set of advocates who argue that uh, zero rating drives this wedge between the price of the online video service coming from an ISP and the price of something similar coming from somebody outside the ISP that's driving a wedge uh, between the two. It's artificial. The users see it, and that therefore disadvantages the outsider. That's the argument. Uh, as an economist, I'm just going to say the direction of that effect is correct, uh, and the open question is, is it really big enough to matter? Uh, I don't think we know, actually. I mean, it's actually a hard measurement problem, and that, that, that's number one. You often also hear, if I'm characterizing the debate, um, that, uh, from industry that, that actually the use of zero rating reflects efficiencies from using internal storage and delivery system. I'm not sure why that uh, then should uh, be extended to a, a deal with Xbox. But anyway, just, we'll just keep going. Right? That argument is it's reflecting efficiencies. And then, again, as an economist, watch uh, reading the online, again, characterizing this debate. I, I have the same question always when I'm reading any of these, these things, which is what theory of pass-through are you using? And when would we ever expect this particular efficiency to be passed through to users on a one-to-one -one basis? And what, what evidence do we have for that? Okay, so I, again, I, I'm having fun as the outsider. Let's ask the open question. I would actually further go even further on this one, actually having read the debate, we're actually missing the point. Uh, there's actually a bigger problem here, and it's, it's gonna be with us for a while, which is, I don't think the FCC can avoid this one. Uh, we, we're damned if we do, and we're damned if we don't. Um, if, if zero ratings allowed to stand, that creates incentives that are potentially distortionary. I mean, that, this is just the obvious economic problem because it then creates this incentive to push everything inside of a definition that's potentially arbitrary and then re-architect the way an ISP delivers data to stay inside that definition. And to an economist, that looks, that looks like a, a bad incentive. But I could go the other way as well. <laughs> if we don't allow it to stand, if we, if we rule out zero rating completely, that creates incentives for ISPs not to build something that's potentially efficient and then uh, reflected in, in uh, dealing with uh, potential, uh, um, you know, too much data for the existing capacity. And, and actually, if you study the technologies that are coming online today, there actually are things ISPs can do to move storage inside the network that really are you know, are driving efficiencies, and, uh, you know, it's great when they do it. And, and so, you know, you don't want to discourage that. No, and so, actually, I think the actual issue here is that we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. We're, we're in a place where there's actually not an easy answer. And, I, again, as an economist looking forward, I don't see an easy way out of this one. So I'm going to say the academic thing. It's worthy of study. Okay. Uh, all right, that's and one more. And the last one is easy. Uh, this is just almost the same point everybody else is making, which is that, um, uh, I'll just say it a slightly different way. Outside of Microsoft and Apple, some of the biggest exporters uh, in the U.S. are uh, Facebook, Google, uh, YouTube, and Netflix. Um, uh, the FCC is not set up for ex 
encouraging exports. <laughs> uh, that's not the mission of the FCC. Uh, yet the agency's actions have profound effect. And who thinks about this in those terms? We, we don't usually think those that way. I, I have to say, I did in my recent book, if I can take credit for that. Uh, but most people don't. And you know, what if that were part of the mission? How would you do that? I, actually, it's a problem. We have an enforcement mismatch. It's not really the way the FCC is set up. The organization's not designed for it. And, and there is a big issue there, thinking about it going forward. So. Uh, what do all these things have in common? Uh, we live in an ecosystem with multiple players. Uh, we're using a, just as it's also been said twice already, I think we're gonna say it again. We, we have a regulatory model and set of institutions designed for a single communications provider. And, and that, that's actually mismatched to the problems that are coming forward. Everyone knows this, by the way. Um, it's, I'm not saying something, but it's, it's generally neglected because you, you know, we're always focused on the, the most immediate thing. Uh, and so we, you know, maybe we should think about it. Thanks. I'd like to <clears throat> thank John Mayo for inviting me to speak at such an illustrious conference here before such an illustrious audience and, well, with such an illustrious panel. I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. Better be illustrious. Huh? <laughs> um, well, you, you might expect me to give a strong recommendation for subsidizing gigabyte fiber or especially to low-income households, as one of my favorite commissioners, Ajit Pai, has recently argued. But I am not a big fan of subsidizing wireless gigabyte internet to anybody, and here's why. Uh, we, we, we sort of know this, but we don't think about it. Wired broadband household penetration <coughs> has been stuck at around 75% for, I don't know, about a half a dozen years now. Half a dozen, which is infinite in internet terms. Even though well over 95% of households have broadband available to them, wireline broadband. Um, now, research indicates this is not likely to change. Uh, and certainly the recent experience in New Zealand of introducing gigabyte internet has met with a big yawn from those potential customers, as it does from US customers as well. Um, however, what has increased a lot is the use of wireless, bro wireless broadband, particularly amongst low-income folks. That's where the major uh, usage has increased. Now, at the time the National Broadband Plan was uh, put out in 2010, wireless broadband was not even considered to be a substitute for wireline. Um, I vigorously objected uh, to uh, lots of uh, uh, folks telling me I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but recent developments have shown that I pretty much had it right as the industry has moved from 3G to 4G and contemplating 5G and broadband use, wireless broadband usage has increased enormously. So the first principle for expanding our digital infrastructure to, uh, for the future is ensuring the plenty of spectrum is made available for projected 5G services. While the FCC has talked about this, it has been, to use the kindest word I had, lackadaisical in making spectrum available for today's mobile units. Um, millimeter wavelength spectrum has the ability to expand data capacity enormously, wireless networks enormously. And so maybe because this hasn't been put out recently at all, the, even the FCC can get enough of this spectrum into the markets to meet our growing needs. Now with 5G available, uh, first of all, with lots of 5G available, what happens when you increase supply? Price goes down. So I anticipate customers will continue to shift from wireline to wireless, particularly low-income customers. Just as customers have been shifting from PCs to wireless phones, we will see the same thing happen in broadband. Wireline broadband will always be with us, um, particularly at least in the medium term uh, for video, but the future is wireless and likely 5G. The FCC needs to get millimeter wavelength spectrum out there and it needs to do it now. This will constitute the base of our country's digital infrastructure, number one. Second principle for expanding our digital infrastructure is very tightly linked to what I just said first. The use of millimeter wavelength wireless greatly increases our capacity, just a huge increase in capacity, but it involves much shorter broadcast range. Now, as a result, our antennas will have to be much closer to customers than they are today, much closer than is currently the case. Antennas will be smaller than the big towers are today, 
but they will no doubt have to increase our total wireless towers, which are now a shade under 300,000, I think, uh, in our lower 48, to well over, well over a million antennas in the next few years. We are currently having real problems with local communities building new wireless antennas. Everybody wants to use them, nobody wants to have them in there, not in my backyard. Um, and this problem is likely to get much worse. Even with smaller antennas, the increased density will no doubt cause local problems. Solving this will be the second public policy problems of our digital infrastructure. Solve the NIMBY problem for 5G antennas across the country. And this will constitute the physical base of our country's digital infrastructure. Lastly, quite a different approach, the third principle for our expanding our digital infrastructure is to solve a problem we have recently generated for ourselves. Over the past half dozen years, the FCC appears to have moved away from economic analysis and its orders. And I put that in contrast for the last 20, 25 years in which economic analysis has led to the FCC's greatest successes. Now, I know Tim Brennan, I think, is here today. He's not going to like me to say that. Oh, there he is. He's not going to like me to say this, but <clears throat> when he was chief economist and left, he referred to the recent FCC orders as, quote, economics free. Uh, and uh, that struck home with many of us, including me. Uh, particularly the open internet order, if, which if we read it, either the 2010 or 2015, has focused more on how many millions of emails the FCC has received and the presidential directives, I think, via Facebook, um, and virtually nothing on economic analysis. Nothing. With predictable results. Now, we need to base our regulatory decisions on economic analysis once again. It's been too long since we've done that. To establish a sound regulatory policy for our digital, future digital infrastructure. Now, fortunately, fortunately, we have with us today our very best chance of reversing this sorry trend. <laughs> and that is my friend and colleague, Katya Seem, now the FC's chief economist. Katya, we are counting on you to establish <laughs> economics as the intellectual base of our digital infrastructure. Thank you. Right. Uh, it's a tall order here. Um, well, th thank you very much, everybody. I was a little worried maybe there would be a lot of overlap and we wouldn't have uh, much to offer, but that uh, has not been the case at all. Um, at this point, I'd like to just open the discussion up to the floor if there are any questions. Much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, hi, I'm Larry Downs from the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Um, Professor Greenstein, could you go back to your second, as long as your slides are still there, to your to your second point? I had a, a question about it. When you talked about how uh, GDP doesn't include free services, um, and I'm just wondering, is it a bigger problem in that in that um, how is that different from the concept of consumer surplus? So, for example, my cell phone today, whatever I'm paying for it, uh, it's, it's not the same device that it was even three years ago, certainly not five years ago. It does a lot more things, but, uh, but I don't imagine that, that, that GDP measurements take into account the additional value of the, of the new features or the new services. Is that what you were getting at in your, your point here about the, the not taking into account this, or is it even a bigger problem? Good, uh, good question. Um, uh, so part of it is what you're referring to. So there is a, the, um, uh, yeah, there, let's do cell phones. Uh, demand for mobility um, is uh, driving uh, increasing use. Um, it's not uh, otherwise an, an attribute that's not um, uh, reflected in GDP. All, the only thing we're going to care about is the revenue. And even though users are benefiting uh, far more than the revenue they're expending, we don't, we don't, account for that in the uh, uh, price index for cell phones. Uh, and so it's undercounting, undermeasuring the benefits, right? That's, that's the example. And uh, particularly in new goods, that's a, that's a perennial issue. Um, so yes, that's part of it. 
Uh, that <clears> is part of it. A, a tablet also, right? Again, new good. Anything where you're seeing new goods and wide adoption generally will have this property. There is an additional thing going on. So yes, I'm agreeing with you. That's, that, that's been understood, though it's difficult, though it's possible to do something about. Uh, there's an additional thing I think going on in the, in the modern setting, which is the predominance of two-sided or multi-sided platforms, which generate quid pro quos between one side who's doing something at no price and the other side who's doing something at a transactional price. GD, that's an additional kind of phenomena that has grown in scale in the digital economy. Um, it is standard GDP practice to only count the transactional side and simply ignore the non-transactional side. And so my assertion and speculation is that the prevalence of that miscounting is much larger now than it used to be. Um, and it's different in, its, in the way you would address it. It is still a consumer surplus problem, but actually you would address it differently than you would the previously uh, uh, attribute issues. There is a third thing going on as well, um, which has to do with um, uh, inputs into production which are unpriced because they're open source. And again, there's a trans, and they're unlicensed. Uh, so uh, uh, use of Wi-Fi, to, uh, you know, to, to use an example, since it's an unlicensed, it's an unlicensed technology, generally open source software, and also an, a non, it, you charge for it in Starbucks, but most places don't charge for it anymore. Okay, the hotel we just stayed at didn't charge for it, but some hotels do. Okay, but most of the time you don't pay for it. That, um, that also does not get counted, uh, and that's uh, uh, in, often an input into production, and so we have a productivity mismeasurement as well. That's actually quite substantial. Most of the digital technologies we're using came out of universities at, with no licensing for their use. So you can't see any, there's nothing, GDP measurement just doesn't pick up anything. So that, those are sort of three things, that, and, I, and I assert that latter one also is much more prevalent today than it used to be. Uh, John, one to two. Uh, just uh, since we're in the absolutely arcane world of GDP accounting yeah, yeah. and the risk of everybody running for the doors, uh, th this is uh, this actually. There's another uh, sort of corollary to this, and that is that in the GDP accounts, uh, we only count the production of new goods and services, not secondary market transactions. And what that does is have a create a risk of us systematically as a society under. Um, undervaluing transactions that occur in secondary markets. Where this comes into play, I think most in our space is in what Jerry mentioned, which is, is in spectrum auctions or spectrum, spectrum markets, which, which if we allow secondary sales of spectrum, which can, I believe, very much enhance uh, consumer welfare at the end of the day, uh, that's a very good thing. Yet it's very difficult for us to, as a, as GDP accountants to recognize the value of that. So I had a quick uh, corollary. I agree with the basic story Shane's telling, but <clears throat> uh, if we think about uh, moving from the measurement of prices, which is what we typically do with GDP accounting, and start thinking about quality adjusted prices, <clears throat> we realize that a lot of the things that are free serve as inputs that improve the quality of the things we measure. So for example, uh, search makes advertising work much more effectively than would otherwise. <clears throat> so I, I would say what we really need is less a move to put a price on things that are free, but, but a move to measure the quality of these services, uh, which the free inputs really affect substantially. So uh, my, my name is Carolyn Brandon, I too am with the Georgetown Center. Um, I wanted to follow up, uh, Professor Greenstein, on your on this issue, which is the undercounting. Can you uh, maybe string out for us what you think some of the public policy implications are from, A, the reality that you're describing that we're not capturing, and you know, what are the implications if we somehow you know, figured out a way to begin to capture it? And uh, bottom line is, why should we care that the, the reality you just described is, is happening out there? Certain other people at the table would have an opinion on this one. I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll do a simple answer at Bob Gordon's expense. Uh, if you know uh, uh, Bob Gordon's most recent book, uh, uh, the last 50 pages is, is full of a diatribe about how economic growth 
uh, uh, driven by innovation has ne is no longer possible and uh, uh, you know uh, like we had in the previous uh, 50 years uh, that's I'm summarizing a, a very long and uh, you know if you don't keep track of what's going on recently and if you just read the GDP numbers as Bob is smart enough to do that, that is the conclusion you might run you might come to and I just think it's just completely misguided uh, and, uh, and that's that, boy, gets you a very different, if you think we're gonna get economic growth from the new technologies that are being deployed now, if you think f Wi-Fi and 5G do lead to economic growth uh, and, and uh, do offer an opportunity for the uh, country to deal with its headwinds, uh, th then you do come to a whole range of different public policy conclusions. So uh, just to give you a start. Uh, I agree with Shane here, but I think it's worse than he's making out. Um, you have to remember GDP was constructed in a period when mostly what we did in this country is we either grew stuff or we made stuff, products, agriculture, and we sold it, and there was a price at which we sold it. There were attempts, if we were making new stuff, to try to do quality adjustment on that, on the product level. Never very successful, but at least people recognize that was the way to go. As we've moved more towards a service economy and to a technological economy, all bets are off. It gets much, much worse. What Shane has been talking about is how worse it gets. But, you know, for 40, 50 years, it hasn't been very good. Now, do we suggest, for example, I mean, one of the big things in this country we worry about is productivity growth. Well, how do you measure productivity growth? Well, guess what? GDP matters. And we are not measuring it very well at all. Now, we're kind of doing a lot of, gee, we haven't had productivity growth. <laughs> uh, this is, again, Bob Gordon's book. Um, we haven't had productivity growth um, for since 1975. Very little. Okay? There's a brief span in the 90s. We had a lot of it. Okay? Uh, but then it kind of went away. Is this a measurement issue? I possibly agree with Sean, I think it is. But it's, it's a much broader one than simply new technology. And, and I think it's, it's not just that there's a measurement issue, but that the, the sort of notion of this panel or the day is that there's a, at least a, a, a gut level feel, I think by several of the people here, that, that we need not accept that as fatalistically given that innovation's uh, not going to change that there actually are regulatory and public policies that can either enable or retard the rate of innovation and investment in this country. And, and that's what we want to find out about. All right, I think we have time for one last quick question. Thank you. Oh, okay, perfect, sorry. Okay, uh, my name is Mike Mandel. I'm at the Progressive Policy Institute. I'm also a senior fellow at the Mac Institute for Innovation Management at Wharton. I actually want to follow up on Carolyn's question in talking about trade policy. One of the interesting things about exports, service exports, is they're measured by tracking the flows of money. So if we have these free services and no money changes hands in the cross-border sense, we're not picking them up as exports or imports. So it looks like our digital cross-border flows are much less important than they really are. I wrote a paper about this a couple of years ago. Um, and what that means is our trade negotiators who are guided by the trade statistics end up under-emphasizing cross-border data flows because they don't show up. So a lot of what Google does in Europe doesn't actually show up anywhere in the trade statistics because there isn't, there isn't a you kind of have to, this is more GDP accounting, you have to get down into the basement to see it. Um, but a lot of what these guys are doing overseas because they're free services, don't actually get sh picked up in what the BEA counts. So uh, when you're asking for consequences, one of the biggest influences we're actually seeing right now is it distorts trade policy and trade negotiations. I'm sorry, do you have a question for the panel? <laughs> I'm just following you. I think this is related to what uh, uh, Shane was saying about, uh, about uh, exports. Okay. 
I think, um, I think uh, on that note, then I will close. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you.